Good evening. It is so great to see so many people turn out to uh, our Lenten series where we are challenging ourselves to rethink how we look at things and how we discern things. And uh, I remember when Adam came up with the theme, I'm saying, rethink, what, uh, what are my old parishioners going to say about rethinking? They're going to think I lost it because you can't redirect theology. He says, no, Father, we're not changing it. We're just thinking differently on our approach and how we understand things. And how beautiful a season of the church for us to do that, the season of Lent where it calls us into prayer. It calls us into deeper contemplation of the knowledge of God so the interior of our being can be strengthened as we live out in the world. The wisdom of the church to set this time for us is so beautiful and how much we need it because we struggle, and many of us, every day in our workplace, in our homes, and we need uh, the wisdom of God always to be before us. And the, we need to understand the power and authority that comes from God and his love of his son that is given to us that we may live under that power and authority. So in that spirit tonight, I welcome you um, as we have our second series and uh, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide our panel and uh, to be with us this night that we can open our hearts and our minds to discern where God is calling us and how he is calling us to respond to his love. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lord, send forth your spirit upon us as we place our hope and trust in you. And as we gather in this holy season, awaken our minds to the fullness of your truth. Awaken our hearts to your mercy that we may know of your divine mercy that dwells and live through that mercy as we receive it in our own failings and as we extend it to those who need pardon from us. Open our minds that we may be conscious not only of ourselves and our growth spiritually, but the needs of those among us, especially the love of neighbor, the love of strangers in our midst. Tonight we ask your blessing to be upon us, your Holy Spirit to guide us as we place our hope and trust in you, knowing of your great love through your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to Adam Conk, who will be leading us tonight in our discussion. So, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Test. Um, and part of that call in, in the Greek is really rethink, like re- change the way you look at things. And so, to show the relevance, relevance of tonight's topic, raise your hand if you think prayer is very important in your spiritual life. Okay, great. Keep it raised if... You wish you prayed more in your life. Okay, perfect. So you see how relevant tonight's topic is. And a lot of times that comes from, I just need to be more disciplined, or I need to try harder. But sometimes it's, I need to rethink and look at how, what is a prayer life to begin with. And so tonight we have two panelists that can really help us think about this again. To my left, Mrs. Mary Rose Verrett from the mountains of Virginia. Mm. Originally. All the, originally. <laughs> all the way to Brobridge, where she's married to Ryan. Uh, who's standing over there with with my elder little baby. And um, her and her husband, Ryan, founded Witness to Love, which is a marriage preparation and enrichment ministry that's touched the lives of people from Canada to the Philippines to even places like San Francisco, right? So uh, we're blessed to have them tonight. Miss Mary Rose Verrett. Thank you. And to her left, Father Michael Champagne, a member of the community of Jesus Crucified from the metropolis of Leonville. And Grand Village. Up, up Grand village. Grand village. Um, and of course, he needs very little introduction to me. Father has traveled the world speaking about our topic tonight. So, welcome, Father Michael Champagne. Yeah. So, Father, we'll begin with you. And with the topic being rethink and, and relooking at a prayer life, and that in mind, um, being that many of us here already agree prayer is important already agree that we want more prayer. How do we look at the very idea of prayer, maybe this Lent, in a way that would be helpful to us, kind of approaching what prayer is and what the goal of prayer might be in our life? Well, I think you started off well. We, we do pray, and uh, we need regular times of prayer. Uh, but there's only so many hours in the day. You know, everyone wants to pray more. But uh, you can only pray 
only put so many, so many uh, hours of prayer in a day. So you have to have some uh, regular discipline. And I, the end points, the middle point, I guess it's like seasoning a, a turkey. Uh, you know, you got to make some, uh, you got to slice it and put some uh, slits at different places and put some plugs of seasoning uh, at strategic points of the day. So um, I find that's important, if that's in place. Then we have to find a way to bleed it over and so to be prayerful. So I think we can make a distinction between an act of prayer or, the, you know, or, or formal prayer, which is essential. That's you know, the plugs of garlic and seasoning in your, your roast at strategic points, uh, which might be brief and might be, uh, be more uh, prolonged. But then we have to find a way to bleed it over from, from the time that I have some intimacy in the morning with the Lord uh, till the time I'll come back at noon and have another very protected moment of prayer. So I have to be prayerful uh, throughout. So we have to get creative in that. And I think that's an attentiveness uh, to prayer. So in what I do, uh, I remind myself, little ejaculatory prayers, Jesus, I love you, when I have a, you know, a difficult trial or something. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm in communion. I try to be in communion with him uh, during the day. So that's a way that we can try to bleed over from our strategic points, you know, to connect the dots, if you will. So that I'm not thinking about God just in the morning and then thinking about again at noon and then again in the evening. But rather, uh, I have a certain, I'm trying to cultivate a certain disposition of prayerfulness as I do what God asked me to do in my life. Mm-hmm. Well, Mary Rose, um, the idea of prayer, I think we all, you know, we hear that and we say that that makes a lot of sense. I don't think we're resistant to the idea. But in the practicals of life, it can become quite difficult to actually keep that going. So in your experience, especially getting married and, and uh, growing in your ministry with your husband, these kinds of things, how does that work? How does one actually live life in a family and pray? That's a, a great question. And, uh, you know, when I was uh, single or before we got married, you know, I, uh, I would go on pilgrimages and silent retreats, and I went to Mass every day and holy hours every day and did the breviary every day, and I somehow thought I'd be able to keep doing this. <laughs> and um, it just, you know, it's not practical. Uh, and I just, I, as, you know, we had our, our first child, and, you know, the prayers were more kind of like, dear God, help me, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, our first child was in the NICU for, a, you know, a while, and just it was premature, and so a lot of the, the prayers in the beginning were just like, dear God, help us get through this, help us survive, you know, help everything be okay. Um, but, you know, going to Mass every day wasn't happening anymore. Uh, you know, a holy hour, just it's hard to get out of the house, and you'd get all the way to the Adoration Chapel, and then, you know, the diaper would explode, and you'd start crying, <laughs> and you'd have to apologize to everyone in and run, you know. Um, and so that started to go, and uh, the, uh, the bravery turned into praying the Magnificat instead mm-hmm. of the bravery. And for me, like, I think it was almost a pride thing to be like, no, I, I've prayed this bravery for almost 10 years at this point. I can't switch. Mm-hmm. Um, but to, just like Father said, you know, to, I knew I couldn't get it all in, but I could sprinkle it throughout the day. And so to start the day off with prayer and to end the day with prayer and to have set points during the day um, and to... Now with our kids, we, we, uh, Ryan and I pray the Magnificat first thing in the morning around 5 a.m. Uh, we read the gospel at breakfast with the kids, mm-hmm. and then we kind of talk about it through the day. And uh, when the kids go down for their naps, I usually kind of just do a mental reset. I go, we have a picture of the Sacred Heart. I go sit down. Oh Jesus, <laughs> that's usually <laughs> that's usually the prayer. Um, and then uh, you know maybe have a little bit of quiet time, do some reading, but short, not long. Um, and then. Uh, in the evening, we do uh, a little bit of prayers with the kids before they go to bed. We turn out all the lights, we light a candle, we sing the Salve Regina from the statue of Our Lady Mount Carmel. Kids go to bed, and then Ryan and I usually pray a little bit together right before we go to sleep. So it's, it's very much mm-hmm. sprinkled, um, just kind of part of the day. So it isn't the same in, in, in volume as it was before, right. but uh, it, it hopefully um, maybe it's a little spicier. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and Father, as you spiritual direct many souls in the same situation, is there something to this that maybe a lot of us are missing that as life changes and maybe different circumstances call for, you know, different prayer regiments or different rules of prayer? I think one of the, uh, the biggest things is actually to pray. You know, it's like we talked about with marriage prep, you know, uh, or sacramental prep. You have to have the grace on board and then you, then you start to uh, learn how to behave uh, while you're in the water, if you will. 
uh, like learning how to swim. And it's like that with prayer. We have to pray. We have to kind of get our feet wet and have encounters of prayer. And we grow up in that kind of situation. But what was very important I, uh, from a spiritual director point of view is I talk a lot about prayer and I try to help a person pray, but I find that they don't pray. So they need a certain regiment, a certain kind of commitment, like work. I mean, they're going to pay you, but they want you to show up and you know, punch the clock and do a few things around the place. You've got to kind of schedule it in. You have to show up at work a certain time. Certain things have to be done. And of course, you have some help on the outside to make sure you get it done because your paycheck depends on it. So a plan of life is important. And I remember when I was in, in college, I uh, started going to spiritual direction, and my director had me do a plan of life, which meant, he said, okay, put your, your course schedule. I got Tuesday and Thursday chemistry labs, and I got Monday, Wednesday, Friday, my physics, and this and that. And then, okay, what's reasonable? Well, I, I'd like to get two extra masses a week for my situation. I mean, I live right there on campus or whatever. So I, I'd do that. And, and then uh, I want to pray every day in the morning, so what time am I going to have to do that? I've got to do a little exercise. I had a little part-time job. So I just got an Excel spreadsheet, you know, and laid it out there, <laughs> you know, my color-coded. And then I carried it with me to try to get in the habit, and I kind of checked to see how I was doing. Now, I didn't have wife and kids, but I had, you know, other things that were bombarding upon me. And so I, I tried to get a plan of life for that particular situation. At the end of the semester, balled it up, threw it in the garbage can, and got one for going home to Leonville for the, the break. I, you know, I'm going to have a break, and that's when things really got unraveled, because I had too much time. And I was, oh yeah, well, I've got plenty of time, I'll get it. So, but I had like a, a little game plan, and so for, my director would make me do that, and so I went through about 40 revisions, and I was in the Trappist, uh, as a Doma Novitiate, we had seven, eight hours of prayer a day, holy hours, and and I had a schedule for what I did with my free time, you see, which wasn't a whole lot. But uh, when I got back, I, I had to let go of that. And, I, and I, uh, as a seminarian and then as a priest, uh, my, I don't have the same amount of volume of prayer. And so I had to, I had to ball that up, throw in the garbage can, and write a new schedule for a new life situation. And so it's, it's a relationship. If, if I, uh, certain times in a relationship, you have the time and, and, and it's, it's appropriate and you spend that time. Other times, it's more of a long-distance relationship where you're not able to spend as much contact with the person, but the contact becomes much more uh, intimate, a little quality. So a schedule is, is, is uh, I think, huge. We have to carve it out. We have to, like a doctor's appointment. You know, I went to the doctor the other day, and he said, well, you're doing pretty good considering you haven't been here in 20 years, you know? <laughs> you know? And so, but, you know, I, I mean, I, I have to, you know, I get my age, I have to carve those things out. It's, it's being imprudent with my health, but with our spiritual health, we have to have that. And the problem comes when we don't do it. And if we do it, we get attached to it. And when life changes, it, it unravels. And the problem is, is I'm trying to apply something uh, in the wrong situation. My situation is very different now. Now, I'm, I'm a single man, uh, I got a time, I'm retired. Well, if he comes to me for direction, I'm gonna say, whoa, you know, one holy hour a week, and you're retired, and you're playing Pokino all the time and stuff, you know, let's step this up, you know, that your situation needs to, you need to step up your, uh, your plan of life uh, accordingly, okay? So I think that's a big issue that people think that they're holier when they've put more hours in prayer, and not, not so. We have to pray according to our state of life, according to what God's asking me. We have to pray. And, and, uh, and then the prayerfulness is that attitude of being in communion with God when I'm doing what I'm doing. So I can be prayerful in speaking to you or having this discussion. I can be prayerful in, uh, in uh, well, I'm fishing. I can be prayerful in, uh, in dealing with, uh, you know, from a brain surgeon pulling on something on somebody's head. I, I can be prayerful in a disposition of attentiveness to God if I'm accustomed to having some intimate encounters with him throughout the day. And you both mentioned this idea of, of letting go, so I want to kind of zoom in, Mary Rose, on that, because in marriage and family, you're not only letting go of maybe your past success in prayer, and you've got to change that, but you also got to let go of maybe even your own vision of how to pray, because now you're living with, well, first of all, a grown person, right? But then there are children that come in who know nothing of prayer that you have to teach, and so you have to change the prayer dynamics almost constantly. And so what's that like? And, and just kind of letting go of what we imagine prayer to be for accepting what it actually is supposed to be. I think 
for, for me, I had, prayer was kind of like a fun hobby when I was in high school and college. You know, it was, it was me trying to, you know, it was like dating, like getting to know somebody. And it was, it was fun and it was exciting. And there was a lot of, you'd say, uh, uh, spiritual consolations. You know, it was, it was, I mean, I was in the Holy Land. I was, in, I was living in Rome. I was, it was just, it was fun. It was exciting. Um, but I think when, when, when we got married and, uh, you know, Ryan and I, when we first got married, we both prayed the breviary every morning. I mean, like, it, and then, so I would say it was definitely kind of the, the, the basket, the apple cart was upset a little bit when the first kid came. <laughs> um, and uh, we just, I think honestly, we became almost more like children in our prayer. Um, it, it was more, it's just like when you get married, like kind of after all the, the butterflies go off and you realize, well, actually, no, I really married an awesome person. They're not perfect, but you know, you start to kind of, there's the give and take. And, and you know, over time, uh, as couples grow older together, um, we know some couples you know, married 50, 60. I've even met a couple ma married 80 years. I mean, they, it's like they, they can complete their sentences, but they can almost like they don't even have to talk. They just, they know what the other one's thinking. Mm -hmm. like, and, and I think prayer is kind of like that. After sure. a while, you're just in God's presence, and he's looking at you, and you're looking at him, and you don't really have to talk. So I think in the past, prayers were a lot of words. Um, but, but now it's more kind of, a, I'd say, like a, a look. And uh, uh, like I might just read... I might open the whole Magnificat and just zero in on one passage and then just pray with that for the next 15 minutes and then I'd be like, oh, kids are awake, done, you know? And so it, I don't feel like I have to just get through it all. I have to finish it mm -hmm. because it's, I just, I don't, I don't have to. I don't, and also don't, I know I don't have the time. So if I know somebody's about to wake up, sometimes I just read the one sentence. And then with the kids, like their questions and their, like we read the prodigal son, the gospel this morning. And so we were going through it. And, you know, of course the kids had all these questions, you know, and, 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 and their questions and, and uh, you know, why did he give the son the, the, his money in the first place? He could have said no. Mm -hmm. you know, well, God's kind of like that. You know, and so kind of, mm -hmm. ex but like I never even thought about that. Why did he give it? You know, mm -hmm. and, and so I think just being more almost childlike in prayer. I think, you know, we, we start out like a child and very simple prayer. And then I think sometimes we complicate it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah. When Father, she was talking and mentioned the Liturgy of the Hours, you, you did a big head nod and you did it earlier too. And I want to bring up the Liturgy of the Hours a second because it seems, you know, there's a lot of things following the council that um, that's some great advice that not a lot of us follow today. And, and the breviary is one of them. I think it seems like there's a connection between a stable prayer life and the liturgy itself, the liturgy of the hours, at least some experience of it. Or am I making too much of that? No, I think, uh, in fact, the, the Vatican... Two councils said about the liturgy of the hours, particularly the priests are obliged. So a, a diocesan priest like myself or Father Chester, Father Patrick, we're obliged five times a day to pray the divine office. So, and, and for you, that's, that's the onus that's on us to pray for the church. And, um, and of course, religious communities, according to their, uh, their constitutions, our community has to pray five times a day. Uh, the permanent deacons, twice a day. The hinge hours, morning and evening prayer. But the Liturgy of the Hours, it's a real liturgy. It's, 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 it has a, a power that's associated with the Mass or with the liturgical rites, being that it is uh, Christ who prays to the Father for us. That's, that's how we're redeemed. And we actually, being baptized, are part of the body of Christ. And so Christ's glorified body doesn't speak. His mystical body speaks. So he uses my voice, your voice. And so we continue this praise as him a praise that Jesus sings to the Father. Now, one of the big things about it, that it has power, but a big thing about it is the sanctification of time. And it goes back to the point I mentioned about strategic. I can't put all that seasoning in one plug, you see, and be done with my roast. I have to have some, you see, strategic. I can't just go to Red Laurel's and work out for six hours and then see you next year, Red. <laughs> that, I, I, it's not going to be, it's going to be harmful rather than helpful. So there has to be some, uh, some uh, a certain uh, time, a temple, and some regularity, so a program. And that's one thing that Liturgy of the Hours does. It, it, it has the times, and it's very thematic with lords being praising, the sun's coming up, and a new day, and thanking them for the night, and an expectation in the evening with the sacrifice. And, of course, I've had a time to sin a little bit during the day, so a lot about remission of sin. And, and then at night prayer, thinking about death, and the sun's going down, I might die during the night, and protect me, and into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh, so there's a, there's a, a, a kind of temporal 
So the day kind of it has a mood to it, and we kind of step into it with Christ at prayer. So it's an important thing. The Magnificat has some of that as an introduction. It's probably the only thing that has really been that significant of an initiative to get lay people to try and to pray, what is your prayer? We're obliged in a pain of sin to do it. You're not obliged in a pain of sin, obviously because of the fluidity of your demands and your state of life. But it's very, uh, I know my mother uh, prayed the Liturgy of the Hours and um, morning and evening prayer. My, my father does. And, um, and sometimes you have to do a psalm at a time. And uh, it's something that you can't always uh, do in whole. But it has power, and it has power particularly, too, with the little antiphons. You see, like a deer that longs for running streams, so my soul longs for you, my God. It's an antiphon, or the first verse of uh, Psalm 63. So that'll stick, and it's uh, during the day. You see, I can take that antiphon, I can take that and, and bring it. Or, or like for the midday office, uh, as I live, says the Lord, I do not wish this sinner to die, but to turn back to me and live. So we sing that, that antiphon to begin our midday prayer. That's a Lenten antiphon. Well, you see, I remember that. And even uh, driving in the, in, the, in the car, I drive a lot. I go to New Orleans twice a week, and that's a big, long drive. During Avid and Lent, we keep silence in the cars. You can't necessarily do that with the, the kids too often. But, uh, but doing that, just silence. I tried it. <laughs> silence, when you, you're silent, you think. You see, and thinking can be prayer, you see. That, that is a relationship. And so I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm talking to Jesus. I've I got a problem. I've got some issues. I'm, and, and, and we're in communion. That's prayer. It's a form of prayer. My, my thoughts, uh, I'm thinking about him. I'm asking him questions. And I can use that antiphon that I get from the Liturgy of the Hours. And that helps me to carry from, you see, it's just like the paprika and, and the cayenne pepper starting to ooze over, you see, and they kind of meet in halfway. So anywhere I slice it, so I say, bon, you say, that's, <laughs> that's the idea, you see, it doesn't always work that way. But the Liturgy of the Hours has that power of, of, of the liturgy, and it has the power of continuing Christ's prayer to the Father, but it has that power of sanctifying the day with little, little things from Scripture that can start to become a, a, a little a catalyst for, for intimate moments with God. So you mentioned silence, and I'd love to get some more into that point with both of you because our title for tonight is Prayer in the Modern World question mark. I don't know if you noticed that. Like, is it even possible? And for me, at least, this is one of the most difficult aspects of prayer in the modern world, because silence isn't exactly a commodity. And Mary Rose, you mentioned praying at 5 a.m. With your, with your husband. And so uh, tell me about this. Like, how do you fight for silence? How do you find silence amidst your children and the work and, and everything? Well, you ha I mean, you have to create it. So if we sleep in, that's it. It's, it's literally like rec recovering that day is just almost impossible. Uh, if, if, if I oversleep or if they get up early, it's just like, oh, no. <laughs> um, but just consciously getting up early and uh, having that quiet time, because it's really, if you wait for quiet time, it doesn't, it's not going to happen. But if you kind of create the space for it and kind of protect it, then, then you do have it, and you're starting from that. You know, you can say the morning offering, and then that way, kind of, that's something since I was seven years old, probably I've done the morning offering, you know, mm -hmm. just offering your whole day. So even if you don't get another prayer in that day, that intention of, hey, God, it's all yours. Um, at least if you know that, and, and you can come back to it and say, well, it wasn't wasted, you know. Um, but the, the silence at sort of the beginning of the day, and then when the kids are taking their nap, and then at the end of the day after they go to bed, um, I mean, that, even in a, obviously we have four kids, eight and under, and we still could, you know, if we really work on it, we can get three hours of silence a day. Mm -hmm. Now, we might not use that whole time for prayer, it might be some exercise, might be some reading, but, I mean, e if we wanted to, you know, it, it's there. I think um, something that we do a lot more in warmer weather, we, we have a back porch and it, we have a, like a cross that's hanging up outside and it's a screen porch and you can hear the, you know, the bugs singing and um, we have a little garden in the backyard and um, we always used to sit on that back porch and just pray and talk, you know, after the kids went to bed because, you know, it was, that's like a, it was a cheap date, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you, you felt like you went somewhere else, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it, just a great space and then Three years ago, we had uh, we had lost a child. We had a miscarriage, and um, we had a, a funeral. In the, and there's a little statue of Mary in the backyard, and we, we buried our, our little baby under that statue. And um, 
now when we go sit on the back porch and we have our prayer time, mm -hmm. um, we're also saying, you know, good night to him and uh, asking him for his prayers. Mm -hmm. And it's become even sort of more special time. And, and the kids, like, we'll see them just sometimes just kneeling there praying. You know, we never told them to, taught them to, never really even talked about it too, too much. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think, like, just kids knowing that 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 is the time for prayer. Like even the other day, Andre, our six-year-old, got up early, and he came, sat on the sofa next to me. And he had his uh, he had his little comic Bible, <laughs> and he said, "You know, uh, I guess now that I'm six, I should probably be praying in the morning too." <laughs> <laughs> and so he got his Bible oh, out, man, now sat down. Yeah, you know? that's awesome. He said, "All right." Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, he gets it. Well, and Father, I'd love for you to help us rethink silence because, you know, when I think about having an hour to myself with six kids, I think about napping, right? But, yes. but rest is not the same as silence, or, mm -hmm. right? Like, what, what is silence exactly? Well, yeah, I mean, you have levels of silence. You have exterior silence, which is very helpful. But Mother Teresa used to say, if you can't, if you can't pray in the, in the chaos, you're not going to mm -hmm. be able to pray in a, in a monastery. Uh, there's always something that's irritating you. You know, for Ter <laughs> Ter Teresa, uh, uh, Jesus, I mean, um, St. Teresa, you know, Who's See, the these beat? things here, I, I, when I worked in the hospital, in ICU, uh, I used to come, kind of, they'd always get quiet when I'd walk, they could hear me coming. So I'd have to hold my, you know, rosary beads. But, so, uh, so just like rosary beads can irritate people, you know, in, in, in chapel. So you have exterior silence, and, and, and that can be helpful, but there's not a lot of it in the world. We have to carve it out, and, and we can control that when we drive by ourselves in the vehicles, make sure the radio's off, television off, uh, leaving the cell phone in the car, the house or something, because we're, we're, we're in a culture where we, we don't like silence. Mm -hmm. uh, I know guys coming on retreat, gals coming on retreat, people coming into religious life, they can't take the silence, can't take uh, 48 hours. They, uh, they, they get uh, like detox because they're used to stimuli and, and the body's used to. Mm -hmm. So in some ways we have a lot of control. We're, it's not just the world, it's, we've become acclimated, we kind of like it and we're kind of attached to it. And so we have to kind of do like a little detox, like when I give up coffee or something, I kind of go through a few days of headaches and stuff uh, when I'm uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, equalize my, my system. So that's one thing, exterior silence, and I think we can do a certain amount, as you say, carving out. Mm -hmm. And even places, like I know on our retreat grounds, we had only about half an acre initially, and we had 40 people on retreat, so we had to make little niches, little alcoves, where you could put 40 people and they weren't running over each other. Well, that's the blessing in your house. You got to get a, a bedroom and, 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 and have it for a chapel and, and have certain places. We have areas of silence, you know, in our, in our uh, monastery. But that's one thing, exterior silence. But then you have this silence, you know, uh, of the mind. So I can be an exterior silence, but my mind's going 90 miles an hour. I'm trying to go to bed in my mouth. I'm thinking about all I'm going to do or whatever. And that, you see, the mind can't think two thoughts at a time. So if I can focus the mind, you see, as good as the mind is, it just can't multitask. Uh, it's got to chop it, it's got to digitize it, you see, and, and, and multiply. So if, uh, one of the things about the mind is if I could just focus my mind and make it attentive on something. Um, so that's what I said, the little phrases or something. That's when we meditate, try to put the mind and think about something and get attentive to something, and it squeezes out. It's like a saline flush, you know, you, you flush, you know, rather than try to suck out what you previously administered, you just flush some saline and you're ready to go. So it, that's very important with silence in the mind, if we can steal the mind. And then, of course, we have silence of the heart. And silence of the heart means my will, that I'm not, you see, running after this and running after that, that I a certain amount of, of wanting God's will, a certain amount of holy indifference. You know, and that's, that's down the line for silence. So that's why you can take somebody like a Mother Teresa who can be always in the midst of a lot of chaos or most of the day, and there's silence all the way around her because she's very much, mm -hmm. you see, living a silent life interiorly because you see her mind's very attentive to what she's if she's talking to me she's she's attentive to me if she's uh, talking to say she's washing she's attentive to the one so she's she's just about what she should be in the moment you know, contemplatives are that way so there's a certain that we call that a silence even though it's not maybe not exteriorly silent around but there's a stillness mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it starts to manifest itself around the person because interior, there's a certain cloister. Mary was that way. The Immaculate Heart of Mary, Mary, we say, is busy and, and things could have been. There was a certain cloister. There was a certain interior silence about the Blessed Mother. You know? and, and so when we become prayerful, we kind of, there's always a communion 
going on uh, with God, uh, talking to him, thinking about him, and being very attentive to the, to the task at hand. So exterior, and then the mind, and then the heart. Uh, those are levels of silence. And I think what we think about it is just the fact that there's no exterior silence. Um, and um, as important as that may be, uh, it's quite, uh, and, and, and not only probable, but necessary that we live a silent uh, life in the midst of the, of the noise because uh, we don't have control of you know, uh, the neighbors, but we have control of how I grab the opportunities and kind of protect myself. You see, by, say, the cell phones, you know, the, the video games, the, the, the entertainment, you know, the, the, the music, but to, to start to, to steal myself. Well, if we're in the midst of not being silent, if that's our daily routine, I mean, Rose, I want to talk about this to you because you work with a lot of couples where I mean, the skills you just described are very much the skills of being a good spouse, too, mm -hmm. right? Like the silent disposition, sure. connecting with God. And I know when you're working with couples, especially ones that are struggling, you know, like how's your prayer life probably comes up, right? And, mm -hmm. and so a lot of us may want this silence, long for this silence, but chase after it for years and never quite get where, we're, where we want to be with it, mm -hmm. just like our marriages, right? A lot of us want so much more for our marriages. And so as you work with couples, like what... How do you help them develop a prayer life in the midst? Like they can't go off to a monastery for a year to do it, right? Like in the midst of the stuff, where do you start? Uh, well, I mean, you have to start somewhere and you have to start simple. And uh, something that Ryan and I had done together, it's called the Couple Prayer Series. Um, it's not fancy. It's basically using scripture to pray. It's a Catholic deacon. Um, they, have, they have a website. If you just Google Couple Prayer Series, uh, Deacon Bob and Kathy Ovies uh, up in Detroit. We actually got to meet them and go to their home. They're, they're in their 80s. Very special couple, beautiful couple. And, uh, you know, the movies aren't well, you know, they're not fancy. The, it's all simple. It's photocopied stuff. Um, but it's so powerful because it's really just helping a couple to um, together say, you know, we, we want to do this together. And just an example of one of the prayers is um, uh, they have... You, uh, has you giving your spouse a blessing. And uh, you say, you know, uh, so I would, Ryan would do to me, or I would, do, he would say, you know, Mary Rose, the Lord is your shepherd, and there's nothing you will want. Mary Rose, and you, you just keep putting them, and that's it. That was the prayer. Mm -hmm. And it was just so powerful. But there was 40 days of that, and it's, you can, you know, you can order it off their website, and, and again, it's not fancy, but it has everything you need, super, super simple. Um, that was the best thing we ever did as a couple because we had prayed so much separately. He had his uh, bravery and I had my bravery, and then he, then he had his Magnificat and I had my Magnificat. We ordered two of them. <laughs> and, um, we each were doing our own thing, and then um, uh, Father Michael Delcom had asked us to lead the couple prayer series at the parish, and, and we were like, but we don't pray together. <laughs> you know, we pray alongside each other, mm -hmm. but we don't pray together. Like, I mean, only when there's trouble, you know, only when you, we need something, uh, only when we're panicking about something. But wait a minute, like, can we just, like, in one sense, it's awkward. When we tell engaged couples they should be praying together, and we're talking about couples who are sexually active, um, they say, that's too intimate. I can't do that. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. yes, but, you know, yes, you're right. It is, it, is, it is intimate, but this is the kind of intimacy you're supposed to have right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so focus on that, not the other stuff. You know, like, this, this is what you need to do. And um, it, it is hard because I, I think just today we're just not, it's not a cult. You just don't do that. Um, it, it is. It was very hard to start praying together because we prayed very differently. And so I think kind of think through the couple prayer series, you kind of understand a little bit about how your spouse prays. Um, like there's meditations in there. One of them was, you know, if, if Jesus walked into your house right now, what would you say to him? And like, so you say, and then your spouse says, and she's like, wow, I had no idea you would say that, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's just things like that. So it's a great starting point, the couple prayer series, mm -hmm. um, to, to have those conversations because you don't even know where to start the conversation. What I want to uh, throw to you, Father, this idea of, of prayer deepening community, because I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I have this. I don't know about y'all, but a lot of times I look at prayer as kind of my project. In mm -hmm. other words, I'm going to collect these prayer badges over time and, you know, like grow like merit badges or something. But, um, but you live in a community and you pray with your community mm -hmm. and Mary Rose lives in a family. Like we all live with people. Right. And a lot of times we feel distant from these people, mm -hmm. people we work with, people we live with. Um, 
And, and modern people are struggling with this isolation, with this sense of loneliness and sadness and, and us feeling like our spouse is a stranger or our kids are far from uh, us. You know, this is a real struggle for, for a lot of people. What is a prayer life? How, what does it have to offer this deepening of relationships with others? And how do we begin to introduce that within a, a community? Yes, there's a lot of levels to that question. Good question. Because prayer is a communion. Prayer is a friendship. It's a communion with a thrice holy God. I mean, between you know, persons. That's what the church is. The church is a communion of human persons with the personal God. And, and at privileged moments to express that relationship that we have right now. I have it right now. You have it while you're sleeping. But some conscious expressions of it. You're married. You love one another. But to give conscious expression to that... Uh, 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 it, it, uh, it uh, freshens the relationship and actually increases the relationship between people. So between myself and God, but you see in community. And uh, so I, I think a couple of things there is one is uh, I've noticed as a priest, like for example, um, doing marriage counseling or um, a death in the, in the hospital uh, in detention, you know, one side of the hall, Come on this side, father over here, and you know because you had broken remarriages and the kids from this and that. It's very confusing, you know, to try to start it out at a deathbed or at a death, and, and there's a lot of tension. So uh, if uh, I've found that just to get people to gather around grandma or something or whatever the the, the issue, and say so let's pray, and uh, let's kneel down and pray, and you start praying, and you talk to God, and 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 they start talking to God, and what happens is. It, 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 uh, it humbles us, but it's also, we, we get a respect. Uh, when somebody is praying, it, it, it melts us, and we see their goodness, their humility, we see the relationship that they have with God, and it, and it removes a lot of barriers that we have. So this is a huge thing when you get people who are at odds to turn from facing one another to face God together and pray, and it, it dissolves. A lot, of, a lot of tension. Now, prayer, prayer in community also, this is a very practical point, it's, it's, very, it's a very helpful accountability. I live in a community, so we pray probably five hours a day, you know, common prayer. Uh, now, that doesn't uh, keep me from praying alone. I have to pray because God deals with me in a very personal way, and I need to prolong that time. Or, so I, I have to pray. I always tell married couples that have families, okay, you have three, at least three moments of prayer a day. You have your intimate prayer because God's calling you on different paths. So you have to talk to the Lord. Ryan's got to talk to the Lord. Zelie's got to talk to the Lord. And so that's each personal prayer. Then you're married and you're your team, you're one. And so that couple has to pray. And that has to pray together. And then as a family, you have to pray. So at least three moments when you have kids, I think. I know in my growing up with nine kids, and uh, you know, that was the way it was. But what happens is it, it helps you to be accountable. Because the kids start expecting it. I get the comic Bible and, and it's time to pray. Or when I get them in confession, you know, they say, well, I, don't go to, uh, I go to uh, Mass only every other, other Sunday because I'm with my mom, with my dad. That's a common thing, unfortunately. Uh, half the kids we see, you know, they're in that situation. So I will say, it's just a kid. He's maybe 10 years old. I say, okay, now what you can do? Now you depend on mom and dad, but you can say, mom, are we going to Mass this weekend? You see, so... Uh, are you, uh, Dad, are we going to Mass? So they want to, and so the fact that the kid asks, are we going to Mass, pricks the conscience. And so it, it's a help for us, you see, uh, to, to pray together. And, uh, and a third point on that, would Bishop Flynn, for priests, we, we oblige. It's, it's a, it's a bur- the brief, it can be a burden, uh, particularly for a Dawson priest, when you don't have you know, community schedule and things scheduled around the prayer. We, we don't miss our prayer. We come in with the ambulance going somewhere. We bring the breweries. We schedule it. We pray on the way. You say, we'll do it. But we make sure that we get it in. Bishop Flynn used to say, take your breviary. You go into the hospital. Pray Psalm 88 with this time. So, well, let's say a prayer. <laughs> Instead of me just ad-libbing and saying the deck of the rosary, I pull out my breviary. <laughs> Psalm 88. Let's pray Psalm 88. It just happened to be a good choice, you see, because i got to pray it, you see, you know, in about 10 minutes. So, so I pray Psalm 88 with them, okay? And then I go to my next room and I do an anthem. And, and uh, so we get creative that people help me, you see, to fulfill my obligation of prayer. 
and we get people praying. Uh, doing hospice work, I used to see that. I would gather around, very powerful, gather around and start praying around the bed, the litany, maybe the Divine Mercy Chapel or whatever. And then I would say, the kids, are, and I say, okay, uh, uh, Johnny, what do you want to pray for? You know, I want to pray mama, uh, mama, uh, mama won't go to heaven, you see. And another kid, I want to pray nobody be in hell. So that's good prayer, you see. And, but it, but it, uh, around, you see, they all, and then they learn how to pray. See, we, the reason we don't pray is because we don't know how. And particularly men, we don't like what we're not good at. You see, like golf. Somebody say, hey, you, you go golfing? Oh, man, that's for sissies. I don't know how to play golf. I, I'd be embarrassed as all get. I just, I, and I wouldn't put myself in such a situation. You find me? Uh, not as a man. So uh, we, we, we're not that good at it. And so we've never got our feet wet. And so what we can do is in community, you start, the kids start to grow up in an environment of prayer. And what it happens is it's, it's a boon and it gets us, you see, uh, praying. So, like, what I would do is I'd pray with them, and then they would call every, you know, every day or so. Could you come back and pray with Mama? Could you come back and pray with Mama? I said, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you pray with Mama? I mean, that's like a <laughs> real novel. Let's rethink. Let's rethink this, you see. It's, uh, you know how to say the rosary? You know how to say that rosary? Okay, well, there, yeah, Ralph, why don't you lead the rosary, you see? And then, Susie, you can do it this afternoon, okay? And so, you'll keep a rosary. Maybe about every hour, make sure you've got some prayer going with Mama. That's huge, because otherwise, they think I'm the only professional prayer. <laughs> so you see, you, 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 you get them, and, and it, it, it brings a communion. So you start to get an atmosphere of prayer. Mm. And, uh, and then what happens is you do get those Scooby snacks. You see, you do get consolation. It does. You do get some, uh, some, some blessings, sometimes sensual blessings. And then there's an envie to do it again, you see. And, and so people start to, then they start getting a rhythm of expressing what they have. Um, so uh, community, uh, every prayer, even a, 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 an isolated prayer of a, of a hermit, you see, is affecting me. And when Moses had his hands lifted in prayer on the mountain, you know, the Israelites had the better of the battle. And when he got fatigue, you know, he, he started to, to drop and droop and neglect prayer, you see, then the Amalekites mowed down the Israelites, you see. So you got her and, and, lot, and up there and they kind of helped them. And so that's the idea of community prayer, is that if we can, if we can be men and women prayer, that's, that's a virtue prayer. And then we become a prayerful people, you see, where we're, we, we're not embarrassed before meals to say our prayers, get in the car, we pray before starting a job, a pray anytime, anytime an important event. And I grew up that way. My mom and then every time you get in the car, you pray. Mm -hmm. Every time you see, before we ate anything, I, you know, it could have been a, you know, a, Cucumber in the garden or something. <laughs> what do you do? You say your prayer. Uh, and we prayed in the morning, we prayed at night, and we had our prayers in the, in the car. So these little, little short prayers, and, and, and it helped me now, even as a priest, where I'm grabbing my bravery, and, and, and we're uh, the crew, and we're chanting the office as we're going down the interstate in the SCU or something. You find me? Because that's what we did when we were kids. So community, that, that's a power. Uh, whether you're a Dasta priest by yourself or you community, you pray. We need to bring people into that prayer. And that's, uh, that's why we have violence. That's why we have uh, disrespect. When we pray and when I watch somebody pray, it, uh, I get a deep respect for them. And, and all, what I, uh, all my sized up biases about that person. I watch John Paul pray. I watch Mother Teresa pray. And they were, as you said, like a little baby. Like a little baby talking to daddy. They were big when they got out from prayer. <laughs> but boy, when they were in prayer, like a little baby. And it gives you a deep, deep respect for a person, you see. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's why these ecumenical things, to pray together, very powerful. It, it, it erodes a lot of our, our false walls between people. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. So we're going to take a little break in a sec, but I want to end uh, this session with the same question for both of you. So, you know, a lot of us here, uh, we want to pray, like we talked about, and we, we sometimes struggle with it. So what do you think, uh, each of you, is a main misconception that keeps people from actually achieving the prayer life they want. What are some things you would say you really need to look at this to get your prayer life going? Change the way you see this and you'll get it going. So you think for a second. In your experience of working with couples and with spiritual direction, what's one thing that you find is very helpful that people need to shift the way they see their prayer life to get it going where they want to be? Bob, you want to start? Well, the most common thing I hear is, and this is in confession, spiritual action, Father, I don't pray as much as I should. All right, and that they'll, they'll live on that until they die. So I'll just say, well, how much should you pray? Uh, well, 
let's start there. How much should you, you know, and what is prayer and, and what kind of the different kinds of prayer. So I think that's a big, uh, 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 you know, maybe misconception is that there are different forms of prayer. Mm -hmm. And they get very specific that, okay, thinking about Jesus is a kind of prayer. Reading scriptures is a kind of prayer. Listening to the, the scriptures being read is a kind of prayer. Uh, sitting down, holding your crucifix and kissing it is a kind of prayer. Looking at your sacred heart mm -hmm. picture is a kind of prayer. Uh, taking your rosary out and, and, and thinking about the mystery or just saying, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus I is a kind of prayer. And so when I direct people, I'll, I'll say, okay, let's lay it out there and let's, let's sprinkle in a few. Let's get some bell peppers, some garlic, and some onions. You see, we're going to chop a little bit up and make a, you know, so do a little bit of this here, a little bit of that, and let's get a plan. And so I think that's what you should do. And don't try to do more, don't, you know. And, and so I think that's the big thing is, is that, that, um, uh, that it's so nebulous prayer is that we just never get into the, we never chop any onions. Mm -hmm. We keep talking about the A2 faith, but we never, <laughs> you know, we never, you know, because we don't know, you know, it's, it's just, it just seems to be too big of a, 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 a problem. Thing. Yeah. I think that the, the number one sort of misconception would be is I have to be a, a perfect person. I have to believe perfectly. I can't have any doubts. I can't have any, like, uh, there can't be anything bad in me. I, I have to believe perfectly. And, and if, if, I can't, if, I, if, if I'm trying to pray and I'm not perfect, then I'm a hypocrite, mm -hmm. right? Like you kind of mm -hmm. just go around in these circles. And, and I'm saying that because I, I used to, to be like that. And, and finally, I remember um, I had actually gone to confession of Father Groeschel. This was back when I was probably about 18. And I was like, I said, Father, you know, like, I spend an hour a day in adoration. I, I spend, uh, I go to mass every, every day. Uh, I said, I just like, I feel like a hypocrite because I still doubt. And he said, oh, so, you know, that he said, say, he said, look, look at St. Thomas, you know, Downing Thomas, that's mm -hmm. his name. He said, you know what, uh, but Jesus still came, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, he said he probably, Jesus and Thomas had one of the most intimate moments because of his doubt. Mm -hmm. And he said, just, he said, you know what prayer you need to say is, um, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. And that can be your only prayer. And that's always stuck with me. So whenever, like, if I'm ever just like, why in the world, you know, we're running this ministry, we have these kids, and everybody's like, you know, inviting me to come talk about prayer, <laughs> and I'm still struggling, you know, um, you know, but you know what, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that we don't have to be perfect or have it all together or have it all figured out or believe everything perfectly 100% of the time. Not that we shouldn't be trying to, but, but you know, we, we, if we have doubts, that doesn't mean we don't pray. Right. We'll take a short break. Welcome back. So we begin session two, which is your questions for our panelists. If you have one, just raise your hand. I'll come to you. If you wouldn't mind speaking to the mic, just because we're recording this, so your question will be in perpetuity. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> All right, we have a question. Question, and I'm sure I'm the only one who struggles with this, and everyone else's life is very happy. But <laughs> how do you pray when you're mad or when you're angry and feel like it's falling on deaf ears? Thank you. Since Mary Rose is married, I'll let her take that question. <laughs> she, she has more experience. Yeah, come on with happy. Because I mean. <laughs> God's always nice yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never been angry with her. Um, I think that's a great question, you know, how do you pray when you're angry? And I, and I think it is similar to marriage because, you know, I, I was uh, reading the Psalms and, and there, you can read the Psalms, you know, the way that they sing them at Mass, or you can read the Psalms, some of them the way they really are, you know, basically, <laughs> God, why did you do this to me? I'm so miserable, I'm so angry, I'm so upset. Like, if, if you go back and read the Psalms, King David was very blunt with God. And God said, he is a man after his own heart. And, and I think just like in marriage, where if, you, if you're upset about something and you don't tell your spouse, then the relationship's going to suffer. And if you sit on things and stew on things, then they have no idea why you're upset. Now, God knows. He knows exactly what we're upset about. But he sees the big picture, and, and we don't. And uh, I, somewhere I had read this analogy of where, like, it's like a quilt or embroidery where we can only see underneath and it's messy and there's threads and we have no idea what the pattern is, but God sees from the top. And, and 
if you're looking at it from the bottom, I, when I was five, I would crawl around under the table and my mom was quilting with all these ladies and I would just see you know, the hands moving. And I'm just looking, it looked like a zoo up there, you know? Um, but, but on the top, it was beautiful. Um, so I, I think that just part of the, it very, of course, very, very hard saying, you know, God, why? But, you know, even Jesus said, I think, uh, wouldn't you say, Father, that Jesus even said a few times, you know, kind of, Father, uh, you know, but, you know. Yeah, uh, Jeremiah, you know, you duped me all lot at my study. I will speak your name no more. And I've said that a few times. <laughs> you know, you know, you end up, uh, you, 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 out of necessity, you kind of, it comes out. But I think, uh, I think that's an important aspect. You have to pray as you can, not as you ought. And that's another big misconception. Prayer, we think, you know, I'm not going to sing in public because it's supposed to sound a certain way. Uh, but, but prayer is real, and we've got to keep our prayer real. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to, to be upset and to, to be very frank with God, he can take it. He's, he's big. Job, you know, went on about 30 chapters complaining against God. And then finally, you know, he got a horse and then <laughs> couldn't talk anymore. And then the good Lord said, you're done? And he said, well, let me ask you a few questions, you see. So as long as we give room for God to, to, to have a rebuttal, mm -hmm. I think his uh, angry prayer is a good prayer. Uh, I think Brother John Joseph, he's studying a little Hebrew, so he's into the scriptures a lot. And uh, so at the Bible study, he thought he would start with a psalm. So he said he pulled out his favorite psalm, Psalm 109, I think it was. And, and of course, as like Mary Rose said, uh, he pulled out the, uh, the uh, unabridged version <laughs> of Psalm 109. You know, and he's like started praying. He was doing this publicly, <laughs> but it got really bad. It got worse and worse. You know, about you know, it's a cursing psalm. You know, and, and, and uh, the psalm was you know basically cursing all his you know uh, all his neighbors and everybody else, and and uh, and so the people were like shocked. But uh, so if you need some if you need some help with your anger, uh, you know, you just flip through the, the psalms, and there's plenty of psalms that would fit uh, you know fit well. It would be a good accompaniment for your prayer. The idea is, is don't, you know, don't scandalize the kids, you know, close the door and, you know, and, and then let God have it and then spend a little time to listen. But, uh, but angry prayer is good prayer. When people get angry at God because something happened in their life, this is very good. It's a good sign that they have a faith life because they're, they're angry. They, that, that, that's the relationship. If you can get angry with somebody, that, that means you're in relationship with them. So uh, that's a good sign, uh, anger. But we have to, we have to be able to, uh, to to talk through it. And the good thing is, God can take it. Mm -hmm. The spouse maybe can't, but, uh, <laughs> but God can. It's a great question. All right. Next. All right. I know we mentioned earlier about uh, technology sort of infringing in on our lives and uh, certainly our prayer time, but. Can, uh, if it has, can, can you guys speak to, uh, has technology helped in your prayer life and mm -hmm. in what way? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think technology, I wouldn't say it has helped, but there are ways that you can find to sort of utilize it. And um, like I love some, you know, chant or praise and worship or, or sort of some music while working and you know mm -hmm. you only have so many CDs and but but on the internet you can find like oh well people who like this song like this song and you know Pandora starts to put together a playlist and some of these are just like oh, wow these beautiful songs like I never um, so you can really you know ha you have access to beautiful prayerful music that you might not e uh, otherwise ever have had you know and so I know for me that's been like sort of a, a newfound treasure um, and then uh, also you can set alarms on your phone, mm -hmm. you know, you can uh, make it, you can put it in nighttime mode. So like my phone is in nighttime mode from 8 p.m. till 7 a.m. I can't get calls or texts or email notifications or anything. It's like airplane mode, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you can set reminders throughout the day, you know, pray, pray. Um, there's a lot of apps, you know, pr praise you go. And just there's so many things that if you do it the right way. Now, like I tried doing ma my Magnificat, praying it on my phone, on the iPad versus the paper, I can't pray off of my phone. I just can't. Like, I, I can listen to the music, I can do the reminders, like, I might read a reflection, but I can't pray off my phone. I've tried. Ryan can do it, no problem, but for me, that, that, that white light or whatever it is, like, it just messes me up. Like, I cannot uh, pray with that. Mm. 
Yeah, same. I mean, we're not, uh, and I'm in a religious community, so we're really not that tech savvy, but a couple of things that it has been uh, helpful technology is one is I have this Time Chimes uh, little software on the computer. It runs always uh, on the desktop. And we have wired in uh, uh, bells on the, on, the, on the campus. So in my office, so I have five minute warnings for all of our divine office. So we have a five minute warning before 6 a.m. mass, 5 a, you know, a, 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 a 515 wake up bell. We have five minutes before all our scheduled prayers. Now the help, that's been a big help for me is because I'm meeting with somebody, say, in spiritual direction in my office. And, and, and uh, so I get a five-minute bell before the midday prayer, for example. And, and I'm in the middle of this, and I say, okay, well, they say, what's that, the bell? I say, well, that's, we have prayer in five minutes. I said, I'll tell you what, why don't we go and, uh, and, and do midday prayer, 15 minutes, and we'll come back and finish up. If it's something that I can't, I'm in the middle of a confession, or I'm in the middle of something, I make that job, I just ignore it. And I say, okay, when I'm done here, I'll go do my prayer. But that's been very helpful because a lot of times I just get in to the, and I could stop the, what's going on or redirect it, but uh, so it's a reminder. It's like the setting the alarms. You got an iPhone, you can set the alarms at time for prayer. Three o'clock hour, somebody will have the chimes and the Divine Mercy chop it. But it's, it's just a reminder, even if you can't pray, uh, you know, even a deck of the rosary, but just a Hail Mary, you know, just uh, at the time, you know, so that can be very helpful, the, the, the uh, interspersing my day with a, with a certain amount of bell ringing, the voice of God calling me to prayer. That's what the church bells was, to call us to prayer. And so we have that on, on our campus. So anywhere on the property, you can hear the bells electronically go off probably about 10 times a day, you know, the five-minute warning to start moving. And our thing is, you know, we have to be moving toward the chapel or in the chapel when the bell rings. It kinda, so we tried to... Uh, so it's helped us to build a consistency of regularity in, uh, in prayer. Great question. All right, next. Father, you had mentioned earlier that we should pray as we can, not as we ought. Mm -hmm. All of our emotions and distractions and our different attitudes that we're dealing with all day, every day, do those affect the effectiveness of our prayers? Well, I don't think so. I mean, distraction. I think St. Teresa of Avila, I think it's quoted in the Catechism, says uh, in, a, in, a, in an hour of prayer. Now, you may not be praying for an hour, but Teresa prayed for an hour. And it's good to know that they didn't have clocks or anything. They had an hourglass. And she would go and shake it because she could swear that, you know, the, the sand is, is getting, you know, the humidity is causing it to clog, and, and I've been here at least an hour, and, you know, this thing's defective. So she would go and shake the hourglass and hit it, you see, uh, and, you know, uh, to, to make time go by quickly. Uh, yeah, so she struggled. You know, they, they're just like us in many ways, you know. Uh, Mother Teresa would say the saints are just like us. The only difference is they made firm resolutions and stuck to them. But they're just like us. They, they were bombarded with a thousand things. I go to Holy Hour, you know, and, and I've got all kinds of things. You know, I mean, we all kind of, we, 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 it's, it's just like you. I mean, I'm not that different than a lay person in, in, in sense of I still, when, when I became a priest, just from my ordination, the next day, my Holy Hour was different, my prayer was different. It's like, it'd be like uh, Mary and Joseph in the cave with baby Jesus, like, you know, two in the morning, and all of a sudden these shepherds come, and these Magi guys come, and then, you know, they got other people. And then it's like, you know, you're Fontanese, so you got 2,000 people. So it just gets crowded. And so I found my prayer got very crowded uh, with a lot of distractions. That doesn't make it less effective. Teresa of Alice says, if, if I am, if I am, uh, it, it's a distraction that's keeping me from God, every time I become aware that, okay, I'm, I'm, right. I'm writing my homily for tomorrow. I'm, be, <laughs> I'm here with Jesus, and I'm, 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 I'm writing my homily in my head. You say, what I want to preach on tomorrow. Um, well, I just back to you, Jesus. And if I do that a thousand times in an hour, what better way to spend an hour than a thousand times, I love you, Jesus. You follow me? So I'm having, to, I'm having to consciously choose God over this kind of delectable thought here. You know, I'm playing basketball and dunking backwards or something. You know, you're some kind of you know, you're daydreaming or whatever. Uh, uh, you turn from that and you back to you, Jesus. Okay, so doing that is not, you're not going to enjoy that holy hour. You're not going to enjoy that prayer. It's going to be very distractive. I get up from prayer and say, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. 
Now, what's my problem? I, I'm thinking that my quality of prayer depends on whether I'm peaceful, quiet, and I enjoy it. It'd be like going to visit mama in the nursing home, you know, and I go, oh, you're my favorite. You always come, Mike, and see me, you see, and, and you remember, mama, tell me when you and dad got, you know, and I enjoy visiting with mama. Then she's got Alzheimer's and stuff, and she's telling everybody I don't go see her, you know, and she doesn't recognize. <laughs> then I don't, I don't enjoy it anymore. And so next thing you know, you talk to her, well, uh, she doesn't know who I am. I don't go. Well, shame on you. Is it about you or is it about mama? You, you know what I'm saying? Is it about uh, visiting mama? Is it about my experience of mama? Or is it about maybe mama's experience? So I think that's the thing that we have to turn to in prayer. That, yeah, prayer is distracted, but it, it actually can, that can maybe help my prayer if I continually bounce off of them. Now, sometimes a distraction is an attachment. And so if I have a consistent distraction in prayer that keeps coming up and it prolongs, like my Harley Davidson. I just got a Harley Davidson, you know, and I'm like, I'm always saying about that Harley Davidson. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't, but suppose I did. You see, well, then maybe I need to maybe, you know, get rid of the Harley Davidson, or maybe I need to, you know, maybe not, you know, be so focused. So sometimes I'm attached to something. And then sometimes it's something I need to take into my prayer. You see, I think it's a distraction, but the Lord's keep putting it in my face. You know, maybe it's my anger to my, a friend of mine, and he's saying, you know, why are you angry? Do you have reason to be angry? What are you going to do about this anger? So the distraction, I start to engage the distraction with the Lord. I talk, I talk to the distraction with the Lord, and that becomes very fruitful. Then I make a resolution. Okay, he wants me to go talk to Ralph, you know, and, and, and apologize, you see, for what went on and see if we can't work this out. And that becomes a very fruitful prayer instead of what I thought was, you see, a distraction in prayer. So you see there's some different elements of that. Right? No, All right. that, that was a great question, and I was enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. What are the advantages or disadvantages of, of uh, meditative prayer or constant prayer, like a rosary or a divine mercy chaplet? How helpful is that or not helpful is that in a prayer life? So the question is... Um, the divine mercy chaplet or a rosary that's a repetitive prayer or, So how are Divine Mercy Chapel to Rosary repetitive prayers helpful in, in establishing a prayer life? Um, I, I'll just speak personally on that one. For repetitive prayer has always been a huge struggle for me. Um, it, just, it just has been. Um, I, I like praying with scripture. Um, I, like, I like the quiet. Um, but for me, like, I would always be, what that came in on? Oh, shoot, where am I? Oh, what, what, what mystery am I meditating on? Oh, look, the rosary's broken. Somebody took three beads, you know. Um, it, it just... <laughs> um, the kids, I'm uh, sure. The kids, they yeah. Really took it. They, ate, they ate them or pulled them <laughs> off or I don't know what happened. But uh, so it, for me, it, it, was just, it was just always kind of a distraction. But um, uh, Ryan has always, that's really just been, like, that's just, you know, every family prays the rosary together. Well, of course they do, you know, and we, but we, we, We've kind of tried to sprinkle some throughout the day, like you know, let's Ryan would say, "Oh, for Lent, let's do a decade every night." You know, we can do this. Um, I know we we have uh, four children with us and one in heaven, so I know when Ryan says the rosary, he says the first decade for our eldest, the next decade for our son. You know, and each kid has their decade of the rosary, and then you know, pray for us uh, the memorari at the end for our, for our marriage. So I think that has helped me because I'm like, okay, now we have an intention for this decade. So mm -hmm. um, not like. I, I'm not going to forget that this decade's for Zayla, even though I might forget which mystery it is and where we are. Like, I'm praying with Mary uh, to Jesus for this child. And so that has helped. Um, and uh, I like the Divine Mercy Chaplet if it's sung, like if we're driving somewhere and it's in the car and, and listening and praying with it. Um, but... Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say, I mean, personally, I'm let Father say, you know, wh which, whether one is, has more value. I think it's just kind of where you are and where God wants you to be. And, and you know, I, I think it changes. Sure. Yeah, the beautiful about the church, we have a whole tradition of prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, prayer of praise, prayer of adoration, prayer of thanksgiving, you know, prayer of petition, prayer of intercession. So there's different, mm -hmm. different and, and it's because it's a relationship and there's, you know, there's different dimensions and how we express the relationship. So uh, I think that, that, you know, there's different uh, kinds of seasoning, if you will. Uh, 
and, um, and, and, and so we need to be familiar with the toolbox, if you will, that we have in our tradition. Prayer. Catechism of the Catholic Church is beautiful in that, about speaking about the different varieties of prayer, different forms of prayer. Um, and, and I think it's like a relationship. When you first, in a relationship, uh, words are very fundamental. You speak to one another. Dialogue means I speak, you listen, and then you speak and I listen. That's a, that's a dialogue. Mother Teresa's definition of prayer. I speak, God listens, and then uh, God speaks and I listen. And that's a dialogue. And vocal, we use words. Very fundamental uh, in a relationship. Uh, well, a lot of times the kids will talk at each other. You know, a lot of they're on the cell phones and spend a lot of hours on the phone. But the relationship deepens and it gets inquisitive. So asking questions of one another, that's a, a form of prayer we call meditation, but pondering the scriptures, thinking, asking, talking to Jesus, wrestling with it, kind of sparring with, you know, with the Lord. So a question, and then, and then and, and, uh, that's important. And I always try to teach my directees, whether they're lay or religious, how to meditate, uh, how to ponder, how to take a text, think about it, and pray with the text, you see. Uh, scripture or imitation or something like that. And that, that's a very important prayer. Now, I'm at a scene of an accident. I mean, somebody, I stop on the side of the road, the ambulance is there, I go out there, somebody got hurt, whatever, and uh, they're dying, and uh, well, let's meditate. <laughs> you know, let's pray in tongues or something, you know. No, our Father who art in heaven, how be thine. And you see, people can get, gather and pray. Uh, very, very important uh, prayer. Uh, so that's the difference. I mean, and then just being with one another, just sitting like Eucharistic adoration. I look at him, he looks at me, just being there in the presence, sitting on the... That was old Father Fidelis' uh, definition. Fidelis, who had kind of brought the Christia down here, said, look, you go down the road on prayer row, you see the little shotgun shacks, you see, a, and you got an old couple on the swing. He said, you see that they're swinging in the morning on that, on that swing? He said, what are they doing? He said, they're making love, you see? You see, that's, that's just being present to one another. You see, and that's a deep expression. They don't have to say anything, a deep expression. That could be silent prayer of adoration, we say contemplation, or just, just presence. So it, it, different forms of prayer for different times. Um, repetitive prayer is very important, uh, especially when um, some background music, when we're meditating on the scriptures, we should uh, uh, meditate. The rosary is like the gospel on, on beads. And if we're meditating, that's a powerful prayer. Um, it's very important when we're grieving, you see, and, and, some, and sometimes we can't even finish a Hail Mary, so I'll just say, you see, Jesus, 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 you see, or, you know, I, I believe, Lord, help my disbelief, I believe, Lord, help me, I'll take that little antiphon, Jesus, I trust in you, Jesus, I trust in you, Jesus, I trust in you. That repetitive calms me down, the movement of the fingers, there's a certain rhythm, it's a very, very uh, powerful prayer. I prayed the rosary every... I, I, I gave a... Con, uh, con, I was at a conference one time, and I, I told everybody, so I've been praying the rosary since I'm six months old. <laughs> then Father Russo got up and said, I've been praying since I'm two months old. <laughs> 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 Which is probably true, you know? <laughs> He's born with the rosary, Kevin, you know? Uh, but, but, but my father made the cursio when I was six months old. He came back like Fidel's told all the men, you go back and as soon as you kiss your wife and tell the kids hello, you say, from this night on, we'll be saying the rosary in this house every night, you see? And that's what dad did when I was six months old. And I, you know, my mom was, you know, he did probably didn't know what decades to, you know, how to say it. But, um, you know, he's praying it tonight on his, on his knees by himself. So it's possible, you know, but, but, but that's a repetitive prayer. But if we pray it properly, it, it creates a certain rhythm. And we tell people we love them, you know, I love you, I love you. They'll get tired of hearing that right. if it means, if, if it's meaningful. Um, and so I think that's what the rosary, the rosary and the divine mercy chaplet can be very powerful to when we're stressed and we're grieving and to, to calm. It's a certain rhythm. But we have to, it has to be mental. We have to be thinking about what we're saying, about the words. We have to be putting the mind in union with the words. Because if I say, honey, I love you, and I'm not, <laughs> I don't care what those words mean, it's just words, then it's, it's doing harm rather than good. And sometimes repetitive prayer can be uh, obviously that. Right, we go say the rosary en, en français. I say, what you? I say, whoa, man, I haven't even got through the first. <laughs> you know? So you wonder if they're just in contemplative union. And, you know, but it, it can be an obstacle if we're not slowing down. And uh, that's what John Paul's favorite prayer was the rosary. Mm -hmm. uh, St. John Paul's favorite prayer, the rosary. But in his rosary letter, he told us how we should be praying it'd be better to pray a deck of the rosary every night and, and pray it well 
than trying to heap up five or six rosaries or a, or a rosary. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's what Mary Rose is saying. Yes. Is, is repetitive is good as long as it's, you see, meaningful. Great. Well, that's our last question for the evening. Um, we'll close with one more from me, which is, just to give a last word to, to us here, um, Lent is only so many weeks, but it's never too late to start a new practice, right? So for a lot of us, we've already had things added to our life for deeper prayer. Um, what would you say, each of you is closing comments to kind of encourage us in these last week of weeks, last weeks of Lent, uh, to pray and to make it as meaningful as it can be? We'll start with you, Mary Rose. Um, I, uh, I started Lent with uh, honestly not knowing what I was going to be doing for Lent. And, and every Lent, it seems like there's kind of a theme, and God always chooses, and it's never me. And what I think it's supposed to be, it isn't. And so, you know, my mom always says, Did, you're giving up chocolate, right? You know, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't really eat that much chocolate, but now that it's Lent, I want some. But uh, uh, <laughs> don't really think about it the rest of the year. But, uh, I, you know, did all the giving up things and all that, but I realized that... It, it, they're definitely like less phone, less noise. Um, but for Lent, my, my intention was to like to uh, actually like go hang out with people, not just on the phone, not just texting, not just emails, but to like set a time to, to, to be with people and uh, and even the kids. Like the Lent, the day before Lent started, uh, one of the kids said, "Mommy, you never play with us anymore." And I was like, "What do you mean? You know, like chase us, like you know." <laughs> Like, like, really, chase you, okay, you know, hide and seek, you know, rough house with us. I was like, okay. So, you know, first day of Lent, my, my, uh, my Lenten thing was I, was, I played soccer with the kids, you know, because that's, that's and I realized, like, that, like, being in relationship with people, even if it's not super comfortable, on the, on the prayer side, uh, there was a book I had ordered a while back called uh, I Am, and then it's by Chris Stefanik, and you kind of fill in the blank, and it's, on the cover it says, like, I am loved, I am, you know, basically all these lines from scripture, but it's called, I am, rewrite your name, reroute your life. Mm -hmm. And it basically, every single thing in scripture that God says we are, you know, I, you are chosen, you are mine, uh, all of these things, and there's a reflection every day on that with scripture passages, stories, super short, it's like a page and a half. Um, but it arrived like the first day of Lent in the mailbox, even though I'd ordered it forever ago because it was on pre-release. I was like, well, this is what I'm doing for Lent. And so uh, every, and all day long you reflect on whatever it was for that day. You, know, to, you are beloved, you are chosen, you are, you are valuable, you know, whatever it is. And it's been very powerful. It's like every single lie that you've told yourself, God's like, oh, by the way, that's a lie. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically this is what God says and this is what the devil says. And um, you, you can just reorient yourself towards Christ by, by praying through Scripture what God says you are um, as opposed to kind of just all the negativity. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's been, it's been wonderful. Great. Yeah, well, yeah I think, uh, I mean, I may challenge you uh, to memorize a psalm. You've got 150 of them. You can choose one. Uh, don't choose a curse in one unless, you, <laughs> unless you're really angry if you're angry. But, but I, I think we don't memorize enough. You know, we memorize a few prayers as kids, but, but memorize a psalm and then uh, uh, and morning and evening, you know, recite it. And uh, then you can get in the habit of like before uh, uh, car, getting in the car, getting out of the car. Choose, choose, a, choose like one of the psalms like uh, 121 through 128. Some of those psalms of the ascent, they're, they're very short. Um, psalm of hope, uh, so, uh, unless the Lord build a house in vain, does it build a living? Psalm 127. But take a psalm during Lent and memorize it. And then, you know, in, in the morning when you rise, recite it, and you go to bed at night and you recite it. it it's very helpful when you're laying down in bed just to recite it. Go to bed, you see, with, with the Word of God on your, in your mind. And that starts to pray. Because it, it strikes me, Mary, when, like, her Magnificat, mm -hmm. when, when she got there, you know, and visited Elizabeth, and the, inter the encounter, you know, and then she just breaks off and starts singing her Magnificat. Scripture scholars go through it in Luke and they say, you know, obviously Luke, you know, who knew the scriptures was putting all this together and drawing from different sources. Yeah, no. Pope Benedict says, never mind that. That's how Mary prayed. She, you see, she was so sautéed, you see, uh, <laughs> in, in, in prayer. She was so much that with the scriptures that she was able to, she almost spoke the scriptures. And so uh, I think that would be one of the best things we could do to create a prayerfulness is to memorize, you know, uh, something from scripture, like, like one of these psalms, and, and to recite that. 
uh, during the Lent. Great. Well, look, on your way out, we have some materials at the table. Our last Rethink discussion will be March 24th, Saturday, which is the day before Palm Sunday with Father Bryce Sibley and Dr. Kathy Allen. We'll be discussing faith and science and the tension between them and their experiences of that and answering your questions as well. So please join us for that. Um, and Jubilee of the Word is coming up in April, Rob, right, Yeah, Father? yeah, Bible. And so you can sign up to be a reader in St. Martinville, reading the Bible from cover to cover. I know a lot of you know how to read, so that's for you. So, so grab one of those flyers. And uh, let's thank our guests for, for being with us tonight. All right. We ought to pray. And I also want to mention, too, there are Witness to Love books in the back. If any of you are married, raise your hand. Married people? Okay, great. You need that book. Go get it. Uh, Marianne's giving me signals, but I don't know. That's my wife, but maybe we need to read the book and get a little more in sync. Um, we'll end with prayer. Father, can you give us a blessing? Sure. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he send you his spirit to enlighten you, to strengthen you. May he look upon you with kindness. May he grant you peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.